So in, in 1988, I think it was, there was a song that, that kind of swept the country and, and hit the billboards, number one for several weeks. And, and if you listen to it in the background, it's got all this music, but it, it really isn't music. It's one man singing a song, and, and they kind of dubbed in his voice was the instruments. He was kind of making the noises himself. And it was about being happy. Does anybody know what song I'm talking about? We were singing that all day yesterday in our house. We couldn't get that song out of our heads. Don't worry, be happy. And, and it, uh, you know, and it took the country by storm because really that's what people want. They want to be happy. And they're looking for it in all the wrong places. They're looking for it in worldly things and... And that's really what the world teaches. Find your happiness here. Man, live for today. You only live once. And so whatever you need to do to pursue this happiness, man, go after it. And if you have to step on some people along the way, man, do it. It's about you. If you have to hurt some others along the way, man, do it. It's about you. And yet you have others that say, no, that's the wrong way. I might be pursuing happiness, and, and some of the things I'm doing might not be the greatest thing in some, some people's eyes, but you know what? As long as it's not hurting anybody else, what difference does it make? You've heard that. We have these influences around us every day of our life that are telling us to pursue the happiness, pursue the things of this world, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, family members. Some other influences out there, you've got Hollywood. Actors and actresses and singers and songwriters telling us to pursue this happiness. Live for today, and they go after everything today. they got a pocket full of cash, and with reckless abandon, they go after this life. And week after week, we put on the TV, and we see them being wheeled out on a cart because that happiness ended. And most would say, again, what, what's the big deal? They didn't hurt anybody. That's what they wanted to do, and, and so it cost them their life, but it didn't hurt anybody else. Rewind a week. A week ago today, and a famous person's found with 50 bags of heroin next to him as they wheel him out. It doesn't affect anybody else. But the reason they found him was because he didn't go to pick up his two children. Wait a minute, it affects somebody, doesn't it? It affected them. Now they don't have a dad. And he was to pick them up at his girlfriend's house, their mother. It wasn't an ex-wife or somebody he's fighting with, it's somebody that he loved. Loved so much that for years and years and years, you live there, I live here, we'll have two kids together, but I'll never commit to you in marriage. Selfishness. And that's where our happiness is in this world. It's about pursuing the things that I enjoy, that make me happy. And sadly enough, that's kind of crept into our churches where we want to just share this light and fluffy gospel that's out there and, and lead people towards all these promises of these great things and never once, never once convict them of their sins and their need for a Savior. Let's point them towards all the happiness. You're saved to this. And in order to go this way, you have to come from that way. In order to be saved to this glorious salvation and to this happiness, this eternal happiness, you have to leave death and destruction and sin. And we backdoor that gospel and we entertain and we make it so pleasing for people. I went to a seminar a couple years back uh, on church planting and I was amazed. I drove a couple thousand miles there and back to hear a man, a pastor up there, tell me that the key to the success of my church plant is if I smile as a pastor. I was done. I heard enough. But that's what's taught. That's what's taught in the churches, that if we, if we just tell them part of the gospel, we're okay. Because it's positive, it's exciting, it motivates them, and it's going to keep them coming back. Otherwise known as your best life when? Now. 
But a half-truth is what? A whole lie. And it's a false gospel. And it's creeping into this world everywhere we go, from our neighbors and our friends and our family to Hollywood to our churches today. Happiness is in these things out here and not found in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not what Jesus preached. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus, if you remember the story, he's on a mountain and he's feeding some people. They're hungry. And they've got a couple fish and some loaves of bread, right? And he feeds thousands with it. And after they're done, they're amazed by this miracle. He goes off to be by himself and his disciples get in one boat and they, take, and they go across the water to the other side. And in the middle of that storm, there's a, the, the, the rowing, the, there's a storm that brews up, right? And they're panicked for their lives and then all of a sudden this man's walking across water. A little freaky there for him too. And they see that it's Jesus, and they welcome him into the boat, and immediately the storm ends, and what I thought was really cool is where they were going, they were immediately there. And the next morning, all these people waking up, probably hungry, the fish and the bread have wore off a little bit here. And they're looking, wait, wait a minute, how is Jesus over there? There was only one boat that went there. How did he get there? And, and when boats finally arrive where they could go over there, they start to question him and, and want to know how this all took place. And what do they want? They want more miracles. They want more things to tickle their eyes and their ears. They want stuff. And Jesus doesn't give it to them. He tells them that he is the bread of life. And he wants a relationship with them. He doesn't want religion. He doesn't want some gimmicks. He wants a relationship with them. And they don't like it. And thousands of people turn away and they leave. Those who profess that they were followers of Jesus Christ turned and walked away. And he's left with 12 men. And he turns to them and he says, do you want to follow them? Just a bunch of pretenders. Pretending to be church instead of being church. Pretending to be Christians instead of being a Christian. Happiness is not selfish. It's not based on the things of this world that are going to please me. Jesus taught that you love God first, and then you love others. There's no selfishness in that. That's a completely selfless act. And only he can speak that, because he lived that. He set aside heaven's glory to come here and to put on this flesh and to live this life of suffering and to go to a cross of suffering, to die a death of suffering, to defeat sin and death and to rise again so that he could give who? Himself something? No, to give you life. It's not all about fun and games. There are actors there are actresses, there are songwriters, there are singers, there are family members, there are friends, there are neighbors, there are co-workers that don't know Jesus Christ and they're on their way to hell. And Jesus was a man of sorrows. And Jesus wept for the sinners. True happiness is found in Christ. And apart from him, they're not going to get it. I know. Real uplifting intro, right, Jim? I want your attention today. Not for me, but I want it for the Lord. I want the Lord to grab hold of your heart and to tug at it and to break it and to draw you towards him today. Jesus, when he saw this crowd coming, he goes up on, on a mountain and he sits down and his disciples come. He opens his mouth and he begins to speak. And he says... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who understand they're spiritually bankrupt. They're nothing without God. They're, they're, they're facing eternal destruction, death. They're sinners. And apart from Christ, they're bound for hell. And they understand their spiritual condition. And they turn from that in repentance. They say, I'm going this way. I don't want to go that way anymore. I turn from that and I'm going to follow God now. I am poor in spirit. Every person in heaven would be poor in spirit. They realize their spiritual condition. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to say this. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, now that's a great little sentence, and I titled today's message, Be Happy, Let's Grieve. I mean, that's just a great sentence right there. Uh, let's be happy and let's grieve. Let's just post that all over the town and see how many people want to come see this. Grieve. Mourn. And like the last time when I was talking and, and, and I said, listen, the, the spiritually, the, the blessed are the poor is not a physical thing. It's not about like that you're poor uh, you're down on yourself. You're not like the Christian Eeyores out there. Um, it, it's not about finances, right? It's not about being broke. It's a spiritual thing. And that's the same thing here. So before I get to what it is, and we talk about that today, let's talk about what it isn't. First, it's not natural sorrow. Sorrow over things that have gone bad. Maybe you heard somebody this week lose their job and you grieved for them. Maybe a marriage is on the rocks and you're hurting for them. Maybe you're the person going through that situation and you're grieved over it. It's okay to grieve. Maybe there's a lost loved one and you go into any funeral home and you're going to see people grieving and it's okay to grieve. It's a natural thing. It's healthy for you to grieve. But that isn't what Jesus is talking about, a natural sorrow here, when he says, blessed are those who mourn. So if it's not natural sorrow, then what is it? Is it the opposite? Is it unnatural sorrow? And there's three different things that you can categorize here in this unnatural sorrow. The first is fear. Take that funeral home again, and maybe somebody's weeping and grieving because for the first time they see death. And they, they're not certain now about their future. And, and all of a sudden, they realize that life does end. And, you know, I was just talking to this person a few days ago, and now they're not here. And so they fear death. What will that be like? And maybe it's self-centered, and the person has lived this life completely dependent on that person. And now that person's gone. And their lifestyle is going to change. And well, it's about them. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Or maybe it's guilt at that funeral home. I was reading a story this week about a husband and a wife and wealthy couple. The wife was very, very abusive to the husband. And all through their marriage was abusive to him, and then he died, and she never got a chance to say she was sorry. And so she took all of their great wealth, and she made this elaborate funeral for them, for him. As if to say, I'm sorry, through the finances there. This isn't what Jesus is talking about. Jesus isn't talking about natural sorrow. He's not talking about unnatural sorrow. So, so what does it mean? It's not natural, it's not unnatural, it's supernatural sorrow. I like to say godly sorrow, because that's what Scripture says. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. You see, that godly grief, you understand why it comes right after the poor in spirit and you understand your spiritual condition before this holy God, and that you are nothing, you, you, you've got this sin, you don't belong in a relationship with this holy God. It should grieve you. It should cause you to mourn. It's seeing sin as God sees it. And that's not a pretty picture. And you understand what that is going to cost. There is a cost behind that. You understand that there's a penalty for that sin. And Scripture says that the wages of that sin is what? Death. And not just a physical death like what we might see in a funeral home. It's an eternal death. It's a death everlasting, weeping and gnashing of the teeth, separate from God. It's, it's considering 
the cost of sin. And it's not just at that time before salvation, so maybe just somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ, this message is for them. It's ongoing. Does sin disappear when you come to Jesus Christ? No, it's still in your life. And you still battle it. It's why, why Paul, you read through, well, I mean, Paul, I mean, th- th- Saul is this great persecutor of the church. And he meets Jesus on the road. He tries to get away, but like the light's here, and the light's here, and it's here, and it's here. Okay, I'm stuck. Jesus says, listen, you used to work against me. Now you'll work for me. You're not only going to go, you know, forget this persecuting the church. You're going to go and tell people about me. This great conversion, if there was one person that perhaps could be pure and, I mean, he's commissioned by God to go and not have sin, it would be Paul, you would think, right? But then read Romans 7. The things I want to do, which would be for the Lord, I I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, guess what I keep doing? I do them. And there's this war that's waging on the inside between the flesh and the spirit. And he's wrestling with it to the point where he cries out, Oh, wretched man that I am! Who will save this body from death? And you read the next chapter, chapter 8, and it's ongoing. I mean, there's agony and eagerly awaiting for this day when this body is transformed and there's no more sin. Sin is ongoing. Have you considered the cost of it? One act of sin separated us for all eternity from a holy God. And the wages of that sin is death, your death. You will die that death eternally apart from Christ Jesus. So there's four ways to handle that when you're you're brought to that, and that should grieve you. When you you understand the cost of that sin, there's four things that, that actually you can do with that. Number one is you can deny it. You can say, nope, you know what, I'm fine here. There's no problems here. I'm doing good. I, yeah, I mess up here and there, but it's not like these big things like the other people. See, we're starting to get like the Pharisees here who dress the part and act the part. But at least they're not like the other people. Do you do that? Do you dress the part and act the part? Do you go to church and act like nothing's wrong and deny it? Do you do that? Do you deny that there's a need for a Savior? Denial is one thing you can do with it when you consider the the, the cost of sin. The second thing you can do is try to solve it yourself. And so maybe you get out a little piece of paper and, and you draw a line down it and you kind of do what I teach in sales, the Ben Franklin clothes here. You, you put on this side of the paper the good things that I do and on this side of the paper I put the bad things I do and you start to list it. And the key here is just to make sure that I've got more on the good side than I do on the bad side. I'm going to earn my salvation. And do churches teach that today? Do they teach that you can earn your way to heaven or put a little extra in the offering and and you take care of some loved ones. It's out there. I'll just take care of it myself as as on that judgment day you'll stand before this holy God and according to scripture and scripture is truth. If you don't believe scripture is truth, why are you here? Scripture says that we all will die one day. We're all appointed to death. And we all will stand before our Lord. Now, do you want to bust out your little piece of paper then and have God look at that? Oh, this is pretty impressive, Jim. I'm looking through here. You've done some bad things, but you know what I've noticed is that you've got one or two more good things than bad. I sent my son from heaven's glory to suffer in this lifetime, to be beaten brutally, to be nailed to a cross, crown of thorns, the penalty of sin put on him, my wrath and my anger towards him on your behalf, but you figured out a new way. Just do one or two more things better. You think that's going to hold up? No. So, so listen, you, you can't deny it, and you can't earn it yourself. 
there's others that say, well, another option might be, I'm so messed up, I'm just going to throw in the towel. I'm going to quit. Maybe you're here today and, and you're looking at your life and, and, and it's a mess. You, you realize your life before a holy God and you're like, there's nothing I can do here. That God would not have me. And you're ready to throw in the towel because there's no other answer. Maybe you're here today and you gave your life to Christ one day, but you kind of slid off track there, and somewhere along the way you're way, way off track, and you're thinking, there's no way God will take me back again, as if you could lose God's love and that salvation. So you throw in the towel. Think about Judas, the man who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus, and how evil got him to cultivate this soil of wickedness and he betrays Jesus. And after the evil one's done with his work, he leaves Judas and now he's left all alone in his sin and in his misery. And what does he do? He ends his life. And I think you and I know the answer according to Scripture that all who come to Christ, will he turn away any? All he had to do was say, I'm sorry, forgive me. But he didn't do it. He stayed there in his pride and, and in his sin and in his suffering and thought, there's no way I can have that. And maybe you're here today and you believe that. And I'm going to tell you that that's one of the greatest lies of the evil one. If you're an unbeliever, he's going to make you think that there's no way that you can get from where you're at to this holy God and have a relationship with God. And I'm telling you, it's false. You can have that relationship because it's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Maybe you're here today and you've given your life to Christ and you've fallen off that that trail. and, And you're thinking, there's no way back. I messed it up. Come back. Long before you messed up your life and figured out how to do that, God had figured out a way to get you back. And I want to challenge you today in your own time to go home and read that story of that prodigal son. You've got two two brothers and a father, and they're waiting on this inheritance. When the father passes on, they get it, right? But one can't wait. Father, I want my inheritance now. I want my happiness now. And he gets it, and he goes out, and what does he do? He spoils it. He gets rid of it all. And then he has to go out and and find some labor job, and he's out there slopping with the pigs. And he's starving, and he would just give anything just to eat the food that the pigs are eating. And in that moment, in that moment when when all this hits him, what does he do? He gets godly sorrow. And it leads to repentance. He says, I have sinned against my Father, and I have sinned against heaven. And he can just stay there, and he can just say, listen, I'm going to deny it. Or he can say, I'm going to earn it. Or he can say, listen, I'm going to throw in a towel. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, I will arise, and I will go to him. And he will make it right. And the amazing part of that story is as he heads down that road, To greet the Father, there is the Father at the end of the road, and he is not standing there shaking his head like, I told you so. I knew you'd mess up. He's not, he doesn't have his back turned to him like, don't even talk to me here. He sees something amazing as he heads down the road, that his Father is coming towards him. And there is a great embrace. Draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you're like, listen, I don't even know how that would be possible. Do you have a story for me? And I do. From Scripture. Here at Family of Faith, we we have a Bible reading plan and we read through this book each week, uh, just a page a day. On the left side, it talks about the Scriptures. and, And then on the right side, there's a little commentary about it. And then Pastor Dave preaches on it each Sunday. And this week there was a story in here from Scripture that was amazing. If you're here today and you don't know about this reading plan, take this today. I'll leave it up here. It's a gift. 
and start following us through God's word through the year. There's more in the back table in, in, the, in the hallway there. There's a great story about Jesus who is having this dinner with a Pharisee. He gets invited over for this time of fellowship. And again, somebody looks the part and acts the part, but perhaps they're not the part. And I always say, listen, being in church and dressing the part and acting the part doesn't make you a Christian anymore. And I didn't make this up. I heard it, and I always thought it was kind of a neat story. Looking the part doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to your garage, standing there, and thinking about your favorite car. And if you stand there long enough, you'll become the car. It's not going to happen. And so here is this, this Pharisee, and he invites Jesus over for dinner, and Jesus accepts it. Except the word gets out that Jesus is going to be here, and there's this one woman that catches wind of that, right? And she's a sinner. I mean, she's not like the Pharisee who's perfect and, and holy. She's a sinner. She's a town prostitute. She's got quite the reputation, this lady. And you have to think, what goes through her mind? Maybe she went through the denial at some point. Maybe she went through the I'll just try and fix this myself thing. Maybe there was a point and she was to it where she said, you know what? I just got to give up here. I, I, don't, I don't have anywhere else to go. And then she hears Jesus is here. And can you imagine the emotions that are building up in her? I got to bring this mess before holiness. I love this story. Let's, let's read through it here in, in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50, or 37 actually. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Now this is very expensive that she's bringing. It's a very expensive offering to the Lord. And standing behind him, she's not in front of him, she's not alongside him, she is behind him at his feet. Here comes the word, weeping. She understands she's spiritually broke. She is poor, and she will pay the price for that dearly. There's an eternal separation from God, and she is weeping in, in great sorrow and in distress there. When you're in the presence of holiness and you try to match up your life with that holiness, it is something when God meets you. And she is weeping, and she takes those eyes those eyes that had seen some stuff that nobody should see. And tears start to come out of them. And she uses those tears to clean his feet. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. How many times did she fix that hair to seduce somebody? And now it would be used for this Lord to clean his feet. and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Somewhere along the line here, this is an act of love. And, and, and you're going to hear it in a second. There, there's a moment in there where that weeping and that sorrow, that godly sorrow that leads to repentance changes at, at a certain moment. I don't know when it is, but it happens. And she goes from sorrow, tears of sorrow, to tears of joy. And she can't help but serve her Lord and give her all to her Lord. You say, well, how do you know that? She's listening to a conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisee and the Pharisee saying, how can you let this happen? I mean, how can you let this person come in here and Jesus gives a little parable about 
two people that owe a lot of money. And one person maybe owes maybe like two months' income. And one person owes more, more, more than they'll ever, ever be able to pay back. And he says to the Pharisee, which one, you know, I'm going to wipe out both debt right there. Which one do you think is going to appreciate it more? And the Pharisee said, well, the person who owed a lot. And that was the lady. She enters in and she knows, listen, I, I can't pay this back. I, I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. I, I, what am I going to do here? I, I, I give it to Jesus. And she realizes that he paid the debt for her. It's all about Jesus. And, and Jesus goes on in this conversation, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. See, it wasn't something that she did that caused her to be saved. The part here with the for she loved much is the thing that kind of tips me off to the fact that those tears of, of sorrow and grief about her sin eventually turned to these tears of joy because they turned into, I want to just love this Savior. And she loved much. But he was forgiven little, loves little. Just think about that in life. The professing Christians out there who do absolutely nothing for the Lord. They don't show their love. But they profess it. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? who even forgives sins. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. As only peace can be found in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how she entered in and the, the, the deep heartache and all the confusion of what this life was about and she's ready to throw in the towel and she leaves there in great peace. I mean, that's a change of events right there. That's amazing. You see, this godly grief, this one that leads to repentance, does that. It brings you to salvation and saves you. But it does something else, too. It's not only just a godly grief for you, but it then becomes a godly grief at the condition of this world that's around us. And I think that's where the Pharisee kind of missed it. There should have been a godly grief for that woman that come in. Instead, it's how can you let her her. God, I gave everything to you, and, you, and, and you're going to let this come in and be with us? No, we should be like all of heaven which repents, which goes into joy when one sinner repents, right? We should want this world, this dying world, these actors and actresses and songwriters and neighbors and friends and co-workers and family members. We should want them to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and come to the saving grace and share in this fellowship with the Lord together, right? Do you grieve for the people that are around you? Do you look at that sin and examine it and realize what it does. You look at those little kids in your life and you say, listen, as they grow, sin will take hold of that. Sin will break their heart someday. Does it bother you? Do, you? do you realize that because of sin, each and every person in this place will one day breathe our last breath this side of heaven because of sin? Does it grieve you? And does it grieve you that the world outside of the family of God will breathe their last breath and then weep and gnash for all eternity? Does it grieve you? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. How can God say that? How can Jesus say that they shall be comforted? Because there is great comfort in it. You see, he goes on, and, and he's talking about this wrestling that he has, the things I want to do. Paul is saying that I don't do it, and the things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. And, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save this body from death? Read the next verse. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
There is greatness in the Lord Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him and all of those sins wiped away. And God wants us to reflect on these sins. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you need to get real with those sins and understand that that is destruction. And you don't get to make a decision after death. You make that decision here. If you're a born-again believer, you understand that, that that sin that you're dabbling with each day, that is separating you from an awesome relationship with our holy God that he wants to have with you day in and day out. And he wants you to grieve over that. He wants you to mourn over that. And then he wants you to give it to him. And there is great comfort in it. Why? Because he takes it away. And if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what scripture says. He will forgive you. Have you done that? Have you asked for forgiveness of your sins? There's an amazing thing. Not only does God work in us and save us, but he is continually growing us more into his likeness. I heard this when I was young in my faith, that when we're saved, we're saved from the what? The penalty of sin. And then as we grow in this process of sanctification, each day being more and more shaped into the likeness of Jesus Christ, we are saved from what? The, the bondage of the sin. We no longer have to be trapped with it because it, it was done away with at the cross. But there is a day ahead of us when we go home to be with the Lord where we will be free from the existence of sin. And that is where we find that great comfort from this great and holy God as he works in you and through you day in and day out. This great promise from Scripture. Beloved, we are God's children now. You're God's children if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. According to John chapter 1, those who believe and receive Christ have been given the right to be called children of God. We are not all children of God. Those who are children of God, what we will be has yet appeared. It's still coming. There's something great now. Christ is in us. But there's something still great coming. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. And you think back to that grand plan of God's creation, created in God's image, distorted from that image by sin, but day in and day out we're being brought more into the likeness of him, and one day that will be complete, that work, and we will look just like Jesus. Is that not glorious? Is that not comforting? As you struggle through things today, to realize one day we will be free from any sin around us. That is amazing, isn't it? And so God wants us to mourn. He wants us to grieve. He wants to consider us to consider the cost of the, of the sin and consider the cross daily. But he wants us to realize there is great comfort in knowing Jesus Christ. And one day, one day you will be made perfect. I want to close with one more verse here. And Doug and the orchestra, if you guys want to come on up, that would be fine. But one more verse. And I think about this verse, and it's amazing to me. Because you think God not only had this plan of redemption, that he would come and he would save us, but then he doesn't leave us to like figure it out on our own. He, he takes us and he walks us through this life and brings us to this place where there will be completion. And, and this verse is about that day. In Revelation chapter 21, he, Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine that lady that, 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 that stood there and weeped behind Jesus over her sin, her tears are wiped away. How amazing is that? That we think, man, we're not worthy, anybody in this world, man. We're so messed up. But we're worthy the touch of this God. He would reach in and wipe the tears away from your eyes. How great is that? 
and comforting is that, that our God would love us so much. It says, and death shall be no more. And then it goes on to say, and there shall be no mourning, as in no grieving. He won't grieve for all eternity. But he wants you to consider it here. There's no crying, there's no pain, for the former things have passed away. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The chains, they're broken. The door of hindrance that keeps you from living the life that God wants you to live, the, those doors are busted off the hinges. You're free to go and live this life of victory. Consider the cost of the sin daily. Give it to the Lord and live in the victory of Jesus Christ. I've chosen this hymn today for us to, to sing because as I was going through this, I'm thinking, what would be a great hymn for us to sing? And I had to think about this hymn writer and think about how he sent his family on this boat. I think it was to Ireland where he would meet them. And on the way, there's a terrible boat accident and he loses his children. And then he goes and he, he gets on a boat and he's going to go out there and as he's going across this water, somebody lets him know this is the spot where it took place. How about that for sorrow? You've got to imagine that the natural sorrow was kicking in. And there's tears. And he hurts. And all that's good and natural. But somewhere in there, when you hear the words of this, of this hymn, you have to believe that those tears that are natural turn to something supernatural. And he was mourning. And he believes in the fact that those sins have been paid for at a cross and there will be a day where you will see Jesus face to face and his faith shall become sight and he will be made pure and whole and complete and he will see those kids again. That's an amazing God that we serve. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. 